I want you to understand their real names. Because when we honor our ancestors, we say there's four ways we honor them. The first way is to speak their name, the way they spoke it. The second is to honor their great works and to continue it and keep it in your mind. Thirdly is uh, the honor, and the third one is to continue their great works. So that's what Taki has been doing. We're continuing the great works. And the fourth one is to leave images, edifice, pictures, carvings of them so that we'll know what our ancestors look like. Sweet, sweet. Because you can see what they do in the movies. They make all these African ancestors Europeans. Right. Okay, every chance they get. I mean, I don't even think Europeans believe it. <laughs> okay, but, but that's the image they give you. Okay. Right. So keep it in your mind so that your children will know right. what your ancestors look like. Look, this is called the Capresh crown, or the blue crown, or the war crown. Uh, most of the time, you see the little curls? That represents nappy hair. The word hair in Madhu Netra is nappy. So when somebody said you had nappy hair, they, that was the Madhu Netra word for hair. But that was to call the war crown. It was imitating a hairstyle of the warriors, the Kushite warriors, who helped kick the Hyksoaks out. And so they were commemorating them. And so every time the king was talking about war or battle or strategic, they would put this crown on, commemorating the brothers from the south. So you won't see this before the third golden age. This came in after the 17th, 18th dynasty. So the 18th dynasty on. So if you see something before that, you know it wasn't the old period. It had to be the new period. So, the room we just left, I can attend. This is his parents. This is Jehuti Mas and Queen T. Whose son? This is Akhenaten's parents. And so, like I said, she was one of the most powerful women in Kemet. She ruled under three or four kings. And you can see. Uh, Royal Cobra and the headdress, vulture and the cobra up in the middle of the So in order to have a statue this big, yeah. you can see how they venerated her. Yeah. Yeah. They used to make the they didn't know we could read them. Now we can read them with you guys, so we don't have to take each of college We can read the stuff out. represent the various organs in the body, like the large intestines, small intestines. Now somebody asked, well why did they sample the intestines? You're not going to read this. When you go through the judgment scene, they ask you questions. Have you stolen? You go, no, I have not. Have you killed anybody? No, I have not. Have you committed adults? No, I have not. And Jehuti writes everything down. So you get past Jehuti, right? So Haru now brings you to his father, who art in heaven. How be thy name, thy kingdom come. So now, Asar examines your organs. The Mesu Rajar is inside the there. So if your liver is all shriveled up, you've been lying. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian, and I don't smoke, and your lungs is all black. So they... <laughs> So Asar, your, your organs don't lie, okay? So that's why they pay, pay strict attention of caring and taking those organs out, cleaning them, wrapping them up, and then preparing them for Asar. So it was symbolic, but you understand the concept. The concept was that you're supposed to be pure in heart, in body, and in mind. So that was to make sure you were pure in body. Jehuti check your mind. And then Asar again is going to check your soul. 
we go inside of there, I hope y'all notice the real gemstones and crystals. They took, right. my, they took my crystals outside. Okay. <laughs> but I got some crystals. I can't show them. I can't show them. Alright, you saw a you saw a turquoise. Turquoise is the most used stone by indigenous people all around the planet. Okay? So the ancient kings, it put it's communication and it puts you in touch with your ancestors. You saw lapis lazuli, the dark blue stone, that's called the wisdom stone that operates on your pioneer's land. That color is called royal blue. So all around the world, people call that color royal blue, not knowing that it comes from here, the kings of ancient Kemet Ward. And so that's why it's royal blue. You saw Carnelian, I show my friend. <laughs> you saw Carnelian. Just, just give me an answer. Tell them. Well, uh, guys, we will have free time now at the bus. We will meet the. Before you go, I need to give you the And they made these little guys called Shabbatis. And they would go in the, great, in the tomb. And they were supposed to be workers in the afterlife. So you no longer have had the. And then Europeans imitated that. The Vikings, when the king died, his wife had to die with him and all the servants. So everybody's trying to imitate what we were doing, but we stopped doing it. Right. Okay, because we realized it was a waste of life. So you see these little, now these were done, you can tell these are real royal because they look like the image of the actual king. Right. But you're going to see inside of here some generic ones. So if your money wasn't long, you, for a bushel of bananas, you can get 50 shawakas. <laughs> <laughs> There's like 38, 40 graves. All his help went with him. That was ritual killings. Yeah. So they realized that that was a waste of human, you know, yeah. life. Yeah. So instead of killing somebody now with the king, mm -hmm. they created these little guys. They're, they're called Shawakas. They're spirit workers in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So instead of having, killing you mm -hmm. and, and having you work in the afterlife, they made a statue. Mm -hmm. And, and representing that uh, represent their sign. This is all symbolic. So that stone oh, that's stone. waiting for you. So that stone thing. He wants to go inside the treasure. Oh, okay. So Afro wigs, locks, braids. So these were real wigs found inside the tomb that you could see that they would actually be wearing. Oh. Mm. So you can see, remember the word nap. Nappy is the word for hair. I remember my mother used to say, comb that nappy hair. Okay. <laughs> so braid, braids, and, and see, they try to tell you that you only had European, you had European rulers all of this time. If you look at every king's hair, no king got straight hair. They knew how to make straight hair. Right, when they did right. the Greeks, they put straight hair. Mm -hmm. You know, and, the, and white women, you see straight hair. Mm -hmm. The sisters didn't, no sister in Kemet had hair like that. Mm -hmm. They would always show braids or locks. Mm -hmm. And cornrows is a, a different giveaway. Mm -hmm. okay. So even in Mexico, you know, the Omic heads, cornrows mm -hmm. on the back. Nubian crop. Mm -hmm. There are no difference between So the wigs would imitate real hairstyles. Right. It wasn't like just some Hollywood, it wasn't no Hollywood, okay, you know, there's some real hairstyles. So people actually wore the hair like this. You'll see in Sudan today, you'll even see the afros. And some of the early kings had afros, wore afros. You, uh, you'll see some of the kings in the thir third golden age with locks, big jumbo Rastafarian locks. Uh, and I don't know how to explain that away. <laughs> <laughs>
way the Western world has it is that ancient times learned from ancient Kemet. But you see the white crown, you see all of the uh, Pharaonic, um, all their materials are being used in ancient Kach first. The idea that Monroe represents the great king. But I want to point this out. On the Sarek, you see this. Now, Egyptologists were trying to tell you that Imhotep is the first person to do this. But you just show up on the Sarek 500 years, maybe 800 or 1,000 years before Imhotep came into existence. Imhotep belonged to a group called Ariankha. That is a, a, a segment of the Magi. So he was a Magi priest. And Dezosa was also a Magi priest who became the king of ancient Kemet. So I'm just trying to show you this lineage goes to the interior of Africa. It's just that Kemet was the best preserver of it. So this knowledge that took place inside of Africa was brought down the down the Nile, not up, down the Nile, and Kemet preserved it. So now, but they, but they say Imhotep is the father of this. No, he is just one of the first recorded multi-level geniuses. So we gotta watch our terminology. We don't wanna do what the Westerners do. Somebody's the father of this, the father of that, you know. No, he's one of the first recorded multi-level geniuses that introduced this to Dezosa. And Dezosa's other name is Neturite. I want you to understand their real names. Because when we honor our ancestors, we say there's four ways we honor them. The first way is to speak their name, the way they spoke it. The second is to honor their great works and to continue it and keep it in your mind. Thirdly is uh, the honor, and the third one is to continue their great works. So that's what Taki is doing here. We're continuing the great works. And the fourth one is to leave images, edifice, pictures, carvings of them so that we'll know what our ancestors look like. Because you can see what they do in the movies. They make all these African ancestors Europeans. Right. Okay, every chance they get. I mean, I don't even think Europeans believe it. Okay, but, but that's the image they give you. Okay. So keep it in your mind so that your children will know what your ancestors look like. What we're going to do now is we're going to separate the This is the temple. This is the temple. This was the entrance temple to the step periods. Habibi! 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 Please, please, come here. Thank you. So we go a space for the rest. All right! Come forward. People at the back, come forward. <laughs> Good students. You are not included. You are not included. You are not included. Here, stay aside. Uh, we're, we're blocking the entrance, by the way. We're blocking the entrance. Wait a minute. But anyway, we won't take back the room. Okay. We are blocking. Come, please, come, come. Because we won't take long because we are blocking the entrance. So this is, as I mentioned before, guys, that this is the complex of King Jesson. I told you that the walls were 10 meters high. To go inside the complex, you just go between those beautiful pillars. The pillars are located in both sides. If you look to the pillars, it used to be 10 meters high, exactly high as the ceiling, as high as the ceiling is located right now. 
we just need the ceiling to show you the original heights, how far the pillars were, were, were up to. If you look to the bottom of the pillars, you can see that down it's wide. Then it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Thinner and thinner and thinner. So actually when they did it, they were afraid that the pillars would not be able to carry the ceiling. So what they did, this was their first try to do a building with the major stones, with the stones as you see. So mistakes are allowed. So to avoid the mistake that what they did, that they attached the pillar with a wall, all the way to the back wall, to do like an extra support so it could carry the uh, uh, weight of the, the pillars could carry the ceiling as you can see in there. Between those pillars, between those pillars, they, they put the statue of the king in there, in here, at the sides. So when you are entering the complex, this complex, by the way, being made by Imhotu, his minister, his talented minister, the one that he's been worshipped later on and considered as a god of medicine as well as god of engineering late in a later period. So as I told you, that's the complex which is leading to a court which that they used to celebrate one of their famous festival in there at that court. A holy festival and when we go there we can talk about. Let's go in there. Trying to say something. If you all look at this, this is imitating real nature. So I, I want, you, want you to understand everything the ancient Kemet U did, they was trying to imitate something that happened naturally in nature. These would have been bamboo shoots or small trees papyrus. tied to get papyrus tied together. Okay, so they were imitating what they saw really in nature, they just did it in stone. That's a bench. That's an Arabic word for bench. This is correct. This they is true. They didn't know nothing about a mustapha, so it's a per ankh de jed. That means a living house for eternity. That's different from a bench. Mustapha. So I just want y'all to just keep that in the back of your head, okay? This is a house of eternity. And they just built them on top of each other. Okay. All right, so I uh, just want to make that. Uh, that's 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 correct but that's the way that's the way it's been written egyptologists that's the way it's been written and that's the way it's been uh, uh, presented that's that's the way it's presented and i believe that he's totally right because this is the house of eternity this is what it's been made this is what it's been more it's been made for if you look in your book, if you Google concrete, it's going to try to tell you that the Romans created concrete. And wrong. <laughs> concrete was being used when they built this in the first golden age. 
When you go down into the Zosa's tomb, you can see where there was a wooden column and the concrete is poured all around it, encasing it in to prove that concrete was laid with the ancient Kemeta U created concrete more than 4,000, 5,000 BCE. So I'm just trying to give you that in your head. This open court been made, this open court been made to celebrate, to imitate uh, very famous celebrations that it used to be. We will, uh, we will uh, go, we will go from here, we will go from here to see, to go inside. Uh, the tomb of King Onas, sorry, the, the pyramid of King Onas in there where we will be able to see the text, uh, the pyramid text, and then after that we will continue, I'll say, as, I, as I promised you, I will take you to the most beautiful tomb in my personal opinion, which is located here in Sakara later on after the okay. Make a circle, make a circle around us. This is a very important Pyramid that most people don't get a chance to see. I love this photo. Mm. Yeah. This is Unas. Yes. Unas is the last king of the fifth dynasty. This is where they have the pyramid text. So the pyramid mm. text is between Unas and uh, Teti. And, and then there's another king in between. So four kings house the, the pyramid text, which we call the Mirkut Sabiat. The Mirkut Sabiat. And so this is some of the oldest spiritual religious writings in the world that's recorded. And you'll see it on the walls here. It's on the walls, on the ceiling, everywhere inside. So this was a pyramid. It's collapsed now, but this was a pyramid uh, done during the fifth dynasty. And then Teti, that you, this over on the other side, is the sixth dynasty. So, and I say so-called because there weren't no dynasties like that. This is still the Persian one. So this is after the great pyramids of Unas. But remember, we'll close. Let's 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 go. But this is the pyramid text. So take some pictures because if you don't get in here, all this is. Uh, I've been like in Tunisia over here guys, about fifty guys, times. There, there is no this is explanation. There is no explanations yeah. inside. So there is so please go to the pictures. Go to the pictures. Okay, okay this was made for me. This is 
where they come in from. This is a mile and a half long and a mile wide. It's the largest temple in the world. Okay, so you're getting ready to really get a treat. You're really going to see some 25th dynasty, Tahaka and all of them. You're going to see some of their stuff. So remember, each king added on to this. You're going to see the, the sacred pool. It used to be attached to the Nile. 
Yeah, this could be a, a tech. The largest Tekken that still exists is here. Mm -hmm. And it's done by a woman, Hatshepsut Aman. Her, her, <laughs> right, her Tekken is here. Okay? Yeah. It's still standing. It's still standing. You're going to see Tech uh, Common, like I say, all of the oh, kings contribute to this particular. This was like the real name is Iput Isut, the most holy of holy temples. So I want y'all to know the real stuff. Luxor is, I don't even know what language that is. Like Greek or? Yeah, Arabic. Arabic, Arabic. 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 Okay, all right. So, <laughs> Menchu wouldn't know what Luxor was. Okay, all right. So this is Waset. And what the scepter was means dominion and power. So it's the city of dominion and power. And you have a putty set and a putty suit. That's what we're going to next. So I want y'all to understand these words because these words have power don't want you to empower yourself so these words have power so we, again as you go through you can see unfinished the reason how we know how certain things was done is because some things are unfinished so you can see the steps of building uh, the hyperstyle hall where they have these uh, columns I want you to when you're standing with those columns and you're looking a basketball team from the NBA if they put their arms around it, it would take, that's how it would take them to get around it. But what I want you to think of, I drew a picture once when I was in college, and it shows the hyperstyle hall with the Kometa U standing next to it. And the next picture was a twa in the rain farms standing next to the giant trees. The ancient Kometa U were imitating nature. So I know that's taken out of context. We just gonna say, ooh, ooh, ooh. And you're not gonna understand that we're imitating nature at every level. Those hyperstyle hall, people from California here, the redwood trees and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. You're gonna see that. And the formula of pi, phi, the golden means is all being used in all construction here. So mathematically, the ancient committee who put all of their science in the construction of their buildings. So when you see perfect statues, symmetrically perfect, they took all of their science and put it into the buildings, they put it into the carvings, they put it in there. And sometimes we miss that. We just be wandering around, ooh, 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 taking pictures, and you miss the science. The scientific formula of symptomatic thinking was created here. So I want you to just think these are your ancestors. You to be thinking high consciousness. Hold your chest up high. High consciousness. You're not a tourist. Visiting your ancestral shrines. The holy of the holiness, which is always they have they keep the statue of the god in the, there. So they they do it all the way from inside to outside. So usually the most old part of the temple is the sanctuary inside there, while the most fresh part of the temple, the pylon that you see in front. And as an example, you know who did, did that pylon? Nechtenebu, the last king at the Pharaonic period, 30 dynasty. He did this big pylon, which considered the biggest pylon all over Egypt.
So Nachtanab put it the violin, but it's not completed. As you see, you can still see the sand drum, the remains of the sand drums there by the, uh, uh, by the, by the wall itself. Uh, we left it as it is to show you how it used to be made. If you look to the right hand side, you can see a beautiful shrine made and dedicated to Amun Ra, Mut and Ponsu, there, to the right hand side. And that was made by the father of Francis the second. If you look at the middle, you can see ten pillars. Nine are broken while one is complete. The complete one, that's considered the highest pillar, the second highest pillar in Egypt after the one in Alexandria. And if you look to the crown of the pillar, you can see that it's the shape of uh, uh, a papyrus flower as a lotus flower as you see in there. Ten pillars made by Taharka, the Nubian king, 25 dynasty city, two statues representing Ramses the second there at front in front of the second pylon. If you look to the right hand side, you can see a temple belongs or dedicated to Ramses the third. The temple, the body of the temple located outside of the court, of the open court of Karnak, but Ramses III became with the access inside the open court of Karnak temple just to put his mark, to have his feet inside the temple to be memorable as you can see there. So what I want to tell you guys, what I want to tell you Habibi, that we're still at the open court as he mentioned, what do we see? We see Taharka, we see city, we, we, uh, sorry, we see Naftanebu, we see Taharka, we see city, we see Ramses III, as well as we see Ramses II, and that's only, this is only at the open court of the Karnak temple. That part of the temple, that was the only part for the people that they were allowed to come in. No one were allowed to go any further inside. Only the, the priest of the temple, and as soon as the rank is getting higher, they are allowed to go further and further. Let's and talk then, about the initiation process that we spoke about the other day, about the Freemasonry, and where they got their secrets and their sciences from, in terms of being, having the steps or stages. The ancient Kemetiu were the first people to lay that foundation. In this temple, you have embedded the code, and, as I think you were saying, the secrets of the universe. That's why it was also ever expanding, because they saw it as the universe is expanding, so does this temple expand. And this temple itself represents the evolution of creation, coming from the darkness into the light. So the darkness is where the, where, where the, where the divine dwells, not that that darkness comes light, as Genesis says. So that's where the Bible gets that, that story from, from this temple. This temple and the pyramids, in a sense, is almost the same thing in that it mimics the story of creation. As we go through the temple, we're actually going back through time, going into the essence of creation, the same thing with the pyramids. As the pyramids rise from the mound or the primary waters out of the darkness of noon, come forth, thus creation is being brought forth. It's the same thing in this temple here. And that's the same thing with all comedic temples, and that's the science of it, to understand that this is not just a temple, this is also what I like to call a three-dimensional glyph. And the question is, what are they communicating here in this temple? The temple itself is a is a is meta lecture. Not just the meta lecture on the wall, but the temple construction itself is speaking to you in that aspect. Like this is the legs here. We're going into the body, going towards the head. And when he talked about the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies would be where your pineal gland is. So I'm just trying to give you a picture. If you see the human body, now you, each temple is a living entity. It's not just some place you go to worship. Church was home here. Your shrine, your church was home. You came here. This was a sacred university. That's literally what it was, a little university. <laughs> and for commoners, people who weren't initiated, this is as far as like, uh, I imagine we're saying this is as far as you could go until you were initiated, then you could enter further into the temple. You got to the next stage, you go further and further. And that's the same thing as the degrees in Freemasonry. I'll tell you where they got that from. So, uh, they, they, there were some people that, they, they, there was people that acknowledged that. So, you know, so we can actually walk to the next phase or go to the next step, Absolutely. which is the hyperstyle hall. Follow, please.
And the king, and the king, it's only because of his power right. and authority. But the king is also the high priest. So I want you to know that the king is the high priest. He can't be in all the temples at one time. So he appoints the high priest to each temple. It's just like when the president of the United States get inaugurated, he has to do his cabinet first. Right, right, right. So the priest of each of these temples is like the Nesupiti's cabinet. They have to represent him. And because every ceremony, he can't be in all of them to the high priest. So only the king and the high priest can come in. But look at Hoppy along the side too. So there is the Hoppy Jewel. That's the, the nature of Hoppy. So Hoppy of the North and Hoppy of the South. Amen. Yes, it comes to and then you see the same cuts are repeated exactly the same order. So I mean, I mean, yeah. This is like Ramses the third, fourth. Got the same Ramses. So they they don't want to say the second name, so they'll just say Ramses the fourth. Ramses the third. Right. Right. Wait, nothing there says Ramses. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about it, say Ram. <laughs> Thank you. 
catching of the flooding of the Nile? I kind of walked in halfway, so I didn't really catch, but it has oh, something okay. to do with the Nile and the flood. disadvantages of the high dam. But I want you to look where the staircase is, okay? To the left side of the last stairs, you have an arch, or a, a, a gate, or an arch. Look at the first pillar, the right side corner, on the top, we have the flower of life. You have to come to where I'm standing, to be able to see it. It's carved on the wall. Oh. A big circle, okay? This is the most sophisticated, geometrical decoration which provide energy and power. If you cannot see it on the wall, you can see it on my um, ring here. This is it. It's here right on the right side. On the top. No, not on the top. Look. There is a top, oh, yeah. look at my hand, uh -huh. okay. There's a top stone, right. and there's a stone right. here. Yeah. Right. There, inside the wall, on the stone, which goes like this, is okay. the first block. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Heading down the mile. in the first and second golden age, you didn't see any horse or chariots. The hikes of the foreigners came in and defeated Kemet with horses and chariots. And so the Kemet to U went and got the fastest horses that exist in Yemen and then rebuilt the chariots more agile, stronger, and better and defeated the enemy with his own weapons. Mm. And so here he is Ramsey with oh, the horse and chariot. They, they put the Tassetti Bowman, the archers on there, mm -hmm. and uh, and took it to them with they saw their own instruments of war. So now you're going to see the horse and chariot as a comedic mm. symbol of war and power. No, the ancient community was some of the most literary people, no. the most literary people on earth, yeah. even, if you, even more so even to today. They recorded everything. Some of the most prolific records come from this period 
um, particularly of that of the, actually, just right after this, when they begin to raid the royal tomb and destroy the mummies and steal the gold and so forth and so on. There was actually a sacred cast of mummies that was taken on other Sahu that were taken and put into a particular location just to protect them. And the priest talked about it, but along with that, there was a court case that took place convicting people on trial that was a part of this grand conspiracy. And it's so important to, to understand just how they would just write all these records down and the reason why they had these mortuary temples here versus alongside their, their tomb. But what you have now, we talked about martial arts a second ago. When you get it, when we finish talking here, you go on the other side, you can see from this period, but even a thousand years before that, That's what I'm these tombs, this tomb is from the, uh, a place called Beni Hassan in Egypt. And you can see the Kemeta U practicing aspects of martial arts. Now, if this is a grand master at martial arts, I'll let him take over from here. Again, we're going back to the second golden age. These, these, come, these guys were followers on the Minchu Hotel. And we see the written records of the Magi warriors and the Kemetic martial arts. And Jiu-Jitsu, Karate, Kung Fu, all of that is coming from ancient Kemet. We already had sword fighting, stick fighting. And listen, it was ancient. This is 2000 BCE. And it was already more than 2000 years old recorded. Now I do want to say this, almost every group of people on the planet has their own little way of combat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't want to make it sound like, well, we were the first people, so that's why we created it first. But we're the first to record it as a science. So I want you to understand that. So, you know, when you're thinking, I know today when you think of martial arts, you start thinking Chinese. Yeah. You know, and, and you're thinking Japanese. Now, mm -hmm. the Japanese, that's just 600 CE in the common era. That's not even, this is 2000 BCE. The Japanese 600 CE common era. Shaolin Temple, 1000. You see? So we're going 2000 before anybody else organized it. And why does this not accept the why does it not accept the bring people who brought it to China and Asia are African? Zamo is a 26th disciple of this. And he founds the Shaolin Temple. Okay, and when you go to China on the walls, you're gonna see black men teaching them. Mm. And if you ask the Chinese, how come y'all don't show this? They say, that's not our job. That's your job. <laughs> our job, we're promoting Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I tell you your culture is your medicine, right. you need your medicine teachers who understand your culture. They won't right. deny it, but they're not going to be pushing it. That's oh, right. Black men told that's us. right. No, they're not going to do right. that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, this is in a place called Mahez ancient name, today is called Beni Hassan. Mm -hmm. Come on, this one, Chinese. Yeah, yeah, Chinese. So Beni Hassan, I think I'm one of the only people that actually took expeditions there. I've taken four or five groups to Beni Hassan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, in China. Oh, China. Yeah. oh, there's several Shaolin temples. Just look up the Shaolin temple. Oh, in China. Oh, pictures. And you'll see them in my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healing. Yeah, Spiritual Warriors Are Healing. Yeah. And, you know, oh, this is on your site. You have a website. Right? Yeah, I have a website. Infundisichahutimas.net. My first two names. Infundisichahutimas.net. And there's a whole so section. Find all your books. Right. And this was called, instead of martial arts, I need y'all to understand the difference between martial arts and Minchu. Remember, Minchu is the next level of war.
intent of the Greeks and the Romans that had come in to mess up things. Mm -hmm. And so, too, what they would do is they would go and take the pure, black, beautiful woman and put her into the temple and make her a temple prostitute mm -hmm. so that black women eventually, because they were so uh, luscious and attractive when they were in the pure of my art, um, then they would want it. But later on, in a place called Corinth, Corinthians in the Bible, Corinth was the cesspool of the planet. Mm, mm, and mm. what was happening there? They were taking the, 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 the priestess woman, Aphrodite, Afro meaning African, to loot her and offer her up in the same way that they would take the men and uh, commit sodomy on the men. So that you need to know when you see people walking around uh, these inner cities, the women that are so degraded, realize that that tradition was not our tradition, and they need to be taught how foreigners come in to use them, misuse them, and in the process destroy the family. the hairstyle of the Kushites who helped defeat the Hyksos. They honored these Africans by creating a crown. Now, a lot of times you'll see little circles in it. That's not a design. That was symbolic of hair, neck. Okay, this one just looks smooth, but uh, that was the Kushite war crown in front of Amun, showing that he's defeated his enemies and Amun is satisfied. The 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should see this uh, uh, on my website. I have all that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Symptomatic thinking, not just symbolic. Everything has a particular word. And look at constantly what they're saying here above this ma'at. They're saying, was, um, was, um, was, um. Dominion and power for your life. Dominion and power for life. But you got to take charge of your life. Dominion and power only comes through ma'at and studying. 
Mm. And so that's why you have Shisha and Jihuti. Mm. And here, this says Master of Appearances. So it's also, this is a, to, to appear to adornment. So he's the Master of Appearances, Mesura. And he's telling you here, Heka Iwen, ruler of the city of Iwen. Whenever you see this, these cities are so old, they belong to the ancient Twa people. Okay, the Anu, the ancient Twa people. Okay, so we don't we haven't talked much about that, but no court was complete without a twa from the central of Africa. Mm -hmm. And the first haru is best haru of the twa. What are the twa people known as today? Huh? What are the twa people called today? Uh, okay. uh, they have some derogatory names, but uh, they are the Sankoy, the San people. Um, uh, Mama Jeffries will even tell you the Mad Wadu. Uh, they're also called, the Europeans call them pygmies, mm -hmm. but that's a derogatory, that's like calling us the N word. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they're the San people, the Chua, the Anu, and they are the people who populated the planet, mm -hmm. who left the African continent and mm -hmm. went and populated every place else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About 150 to 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So is the uh, Chica people part of that? Huh? Chica? Chica. 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 I'm, Chica. Not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Like if you're in the Filipinos, those people call the Nigaritas. Yeah. Those are the Chua people. The Chua. Yeah, and in Japan, they have the Anu, right, who are the original yeah. inhabitants of the seven islands of Japan. Yes, right. That's the same Chua same people. people. <laughs> Dr. Renoko Rashidi did a nice little piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Uh, Mom, can you give us some more things of the Twa people? I gave them the sand, the koi, the sand koi, the uh, 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 and Mbuti. That's the name I was trying to think. That's another name of the Twa people. Another one is Ko, Botswa, and Botswana. Right, and those are the Anu people, that's all those different names. And they're the ones that left the African continent first, maybe 150 to 200,000 years ago, mm. and populated all across Southern Asia and then moved up north. Thank Yeah. 
governor of Elephantine or the Aswan region during the Six Diamonds. In fact, he served under Ruler Pepe II. When we were in Dashur at the Red Brick Pyramid, for those who went up and went inside the pyramid, all those who just went from the outside and looked to the north, the first pyramid you see is Pepe II. So you had an opportunity to see it, the person who he served under. This man is famous for his expeditions to a land of they call Yam, which is in the Sudan, most scholars believe is in the Sudan today. It talks about his countless trade expeditions to Yam and him carving out or, or mapping out certain trade routes. And what's interesting about what's interesting about um, his trade routes, he speaks about fearing for his life as he would go through the Middle Nile region. Going down, he would take the river, but coming up, he would have to try to come through the desert. So the king of Yam, because if he feared that with the goods that he would get from Yam, he would either be robbed or, or killed. So the king of Yam gave him an escort back to Kemet. And one of the things he brought back, which Pepe II um, loved so much, was one of, one of the things. So we speak about these, these trade expeditions, and we talk also about the economics, politics, and culture, that which Dr. Jeffries talks about is the pyramid analysis. Um, here we have an individual who was an economist because he was dealing heavily in trade. He was also a politician because he was a governor of his region. And the culture of, of Navali culture of cooperative economics is what kept them thriving. Um, so Akuf is a, is a huge part of the history, and he also speaks to the history of what happened. So one of the narratives, and you'll see this when I will assemble tomorrow for those who are going. Um, it, it's kind of confusing it sometimes because they make it seem like there was constant wars and struggles between Kemet and Nubia. But there's, with this Harkouf story and others, we understand that it wasn't 
the entire region. And with some people who look here and look at these kind of as borders, this middle area here is an area which he was trying to avoid. So up here, we came at this area here is where this is a hostile group here. This area here is friendly. And over time, this is the region that was constant conflict with not only the people of the South, but the peoples of the North. So, I'm sorry, so we kind of brought it out in the film is that the people in this area here were constant migrants from the West that were coming in from the interior of the continent that didn't understand the establishment of these two kingdoms. And as they would come here, they would try to set up their own situation, which caused the constant back and forth wars between the two of them. So, what the Europeans are not going to say that, what they're going to tell you is that this beige group, if they don't ever want to define it, this is beige and black, constantly fighting. But as you can see, Hakuf is certainly, you know, he's, he's clearly a uh, uh, brother. Clearly. Clearly. So, uh, so we can kind of shift now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is there another tomb up here or is there a tomb? There's no way we can't visit this several. No, no, if, if, if it's not on your map, no. talk about it. No. Calculations. Okay. <laughs> so again, I want y'all to the enormity of the techno brother want to know about science, the technology and science that it went to line that up with the stars at a particular time of the year, going through the three chambers to hit the for holy of holies. So the high dam, this high dam was built by the Russians. They were the main people who built this high dam. And so they had to move this up and over because they had to say, they were making a whole lot of money off of this, let me just say, as a tourist attraction. So this couldn't, many, almost 80% of the Nubian temples and monuments and homelands and artifacts are under Lake Nassau. Mm. And some that were left in Sudan, now Sudan has built a dam and Ethiopia is building a dam. So all the Nubian stuff will be almost underwater. So unless we get a scuba diving team together, that stuff is left lost forever. Okay, but you, you just get a, an idea of what's happening. So this was actually the border. This was actually an ancient Kush. And so Egypt now owns this, this, this territory. Okay, but this used to be part of ancient Kush. So this is <coughs> Ursa Ma'atra also letting the ancient Kushites know just how bad he is. Okay, when you travel this way and you pass my monuments, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, if you're not coming as a friend. So, uh, and, and look how enormous this is. Mm. So you know whoever's responsible for building this ain't no joke. You know, so you get an idea. This was a, a tremendous, and this is done in his lifetime. Wow. So he, I believe it's like 60 feet high. You know, so I'm just trying to give you just an enormity of wow. what happened there. Uh, Haru Emaketi is 60 feet high and 240 feet high. So this is rival in statues like that. 
Man. This is also a political statement as well. similar dual temple but further up south in Sudan in a place called Solak and he has a temple dedicated to himself and to also his wife so this seems to be some type of a continuation of this political alliances that the ancient Kometiu had with the Kushites and particularly when it came to marriages and also honoring their people in their land as well so that's a big part of it also with this temple here speaks about the first peace treaty known to earth or known on earth in terms of uh, Ramses having a great battle against the Hittites. Um, it ended in a stalemate, and that stalemate resulted in the first peace treaty known to man. And you can actually see remnants of it on, inside the United Nations, because that's where the actual records were kept in terms of where they were, um, where it's stored today. Another part of this is as well, is he is more commonly, I guess you could say, known as the, the, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. At this point, ancient Kemet is fighting battles as far north as Syria in terms of trying to have strongholds on land. I mean, <coughs> everything in between, which the land of Canaan and Israel would be a part of, is already a part of the empire. Kadesh, as we said earlier, is a part of that trade route. The Hittites grew stronger towards the end of the 18th <coughs> dynasty. They grabbed control of it, and Kemet was trying to regain that area again so that they could use it for vital trade. So right here on the side of the wall, you can see a lot of that. Also, when we go inside, we can't do any explanation, but there's a lot of information in regards to how they saw their neighbors, who was hostile and who was friendly. And there's some interesting images here that some interpret incorrectly, but we will, you know, make that claim. And I just need you to know, people try to make believe that ancient Kemet was always at war with ancient Nubia. European countries are at war with other European countries. I mean, you know, sometimes you have conflict with neighbors. So there are certain times when there was conflict between ancient Kemet and ancient Kosh. But the majority of the time, they were allies. The majority. It is okay. one particular group. And that's that's the thing. It's, it's so many, we, we understand Africa as very um, like single groups of people. Some people call them tribes. And that's the same thing they saw themselves as. Because these different tribes that kind of moved into the Nile Valley. They just happened to form a, a nation here, but there were always groups of people coming in and out. And there was one particular group that it seems like they constantly had some issues with. But as M. Pradeshi said, it wasn't everyone. It was one particular group. In my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healers, in the first book, you'll get a chance to read some of that. Who, the particular group of Nubians of ancient Christians that they did have conflict with. But then at another time, that same group that they had conflict with became an ally. So I want to show you, was it, you know, just always, like you'll see Nubians in chains, and the European Egyptologists like to say that the Nubians were the slaves of the ancient community.